sermon was really harsh on the failures of faith at home in our current society. The message began, however, with this common thought. You have to have something to give before you can give generously. So I ask you to take last week, kind of as a selfish week, as a Sabbath week, to take inventory and to see what you have and what you need for your faith life to be able to give God and your faith generously to yourself. And therefore, once you're able to fill yourself up and know that God's generosity is a part of you, then, only then, once you've taken that inventory, will you be able to give to others the stories, the knowledge, the insights, the presence, the space, and the truth of really knowing God. And this was the first step in our buzzword idea of faithful growth strategy. The self-awareness that God has given us generous gifts. And yet the self-awareness that also came with a warning. It came with the acknowledgement that there are evils in the world waiting to manipulate God's generous love to creation. And thus even our generosity to one another. And while we as people of faith seek to be rooted in the fruit of the Spirit... Those can be spoiled if we do not have deep-rooted practices and people in our faithful lives. Studies of how to help children, then, become faithful adults, again, show that what happens in the, in the home is the most crucial factor, an important factor, in actually knowing God's love and actively living as a part of God's community, not just as children, but for life. These studies show that intergenerational relationships, both at home and in the church, are what create significant connections to bridge the faith gap between youth and adulthood. You are at the toughest age there possibly can be to connect your faith from being a kid to emerging into adulthood. And so in this place of worship, we seek to create the bridges that help each of us cross from one phase of our lives to the others. We worship with one another on a mutual faith journey that is led by the Good Shepherd for all ages. We seek, I brought the book, what Kara Powell names as growing with, that our faithful growth strategy has God at the center, and then our individual selves are the vessels that are preparing ourselves for generous growth. And another way to shape, as adults, what our growth really looks like. So my role as your pastor, for those of you who are adults in the congregation, is not to ever spoon feed you, but to give you the opportunities and the awareness and different ways to engage in your faith so that you are shaping your lives and thus shaping the lives of those around you faithfully every single day. There's a group of people that I thought about in my experience, you have to shape and form people every single day. And many of those who sit in our pews, there have been some studies, but many of those in our pews each week throughout the Disciples of Christ denominations somehow always seem to be teachers. Take a moment to think of a church in some ways like a classroom. Different students, different needs, different abilities, different gifts. And you as a teacher, and I know I as a preacher, enter at the beginning ready to love, teach, help everybody grow. And if you're teaching in older grades, however, you start to have 
and shocking moments. When that second grade unruly class becomes one of your favorites. And one of the things, though, however, that seems to be true with whomever enters into your doorstep for you to help shape and mold is that you can't actually shape and mold them alone. And teachers quickly know, or those who work with people who are younger, the kids who have food on their table when they get home, and the people who have the privilege to be able to spend quality time with those kids. You know the kids that didn't really have anyone that enforced a bedtime last night. They look starved and they're angry as they walk into the door. They end up lashing out or they get in trouble. Or then they're the ones that are almost even worse, the ones that sit and seem almost invisible and quiet in the corner. Because what happens at home makes all the difference. And as you get older in teaching, you remember, oh, I had that kid's mom in school. It did seem like that family never quite got a break. Or you have that other kid that has everything but does not actually have real relationships when they go home. Their love is bought. And they may have privilege. But they don't have quality. Teachers know, and people who work with others, that what happens at home matters. That when we are in other people's homes and engaging with different families, it matters. And that it matters because if you can't find food, then you can't find nourishment. And if you can find food, but you can't find others who want to spend quality time with you, then you do not have love. And then if you can't have love and you can't have food, all of a sudden if you can't find God, and if you can't find that in your loneliness, then all of a sudden you know that there is no hope. And we live in a world where many children and many adults of all ages are stripped often of these basic needs because we all need to be nourished in both food and quality care. And we, as people of faith, are called again to be home to one another because what happens at home matters. We are called to be the shepherds who know each one of our sheep by name and lead them ultimately to the table where God has a place for them with us. Over the last week, I encourage you to take inventory of what you have that you can give generously as God gives and in our daily lives. And I thought about some things just as examples. It's not always biblical history or deep theological conversation that people need, but a children's Bible helps everyone. Be able to understand and put together pieces of our faith story. In our daily lives, there are people who do not need clothes. They need someone to see them as a person of worth and a knowledge that they are more than stuff. They are gods. And I know, as it says, being a teacher, being a counselor, being an administrative, being just an adult, adulting is hard. It is draining. And we too are children of God and often find ourselves needing so much. But if we come into this place, if we worship together, we remind ourselves that we have God. And more importantly, God has made sure that we realize the importance of having a home with family and one another, and that our faith is always directly tied to the need of community. Thus, no matter what age you may be, you are always growing with one another and growing in your faith. And the challenge in today's story and acts is that radical idea that we are not to grow separately, we are not to grow on our own, that we are actually to grow with one another, not just in here, but at home and beyond these walls. That's my favorite quote, which I will share in probably at least one or two sermons a year. Ohana means family, and family means nobody gets left behind or forgotten. 
connects all three. And it's the same connection that is made in today's scripture at the end of the Pentecost story. It's the same connection that was in our worship and wonder story. It's the same connection we had at our rummage sale with bean soup. It is the same connection that was made in today's video. It is the table. It is our place where communities are communion. Did you ever notice that? Community, communion. There's a reason those words go together. Our communion. It's a place where we meet each other faithfully. <clears throat> and those in the stories of Acts did not separate their home life from their church life. Home and church were one and the same. Because the people are only know what is truly the church. And thus we share everything we have. Even our most prized possessions. Today when you walked in, some of you did take time to draw or write or think about your most prized possessions in your home. You drew and placed it on the table in the foyer. Which is kind of risky. You left it there for all to see. And it can be truly humbling experience to name and place what is most important and sacred to you. It can be hard to actually give that not only to God, but give that to others. Because of that warning of knowing that we live in a world where sometimes people will snatch and may not use that in a good way. So we are often finding ourselves willing to share God's gifts as long as they don't really infringe upon our comforts and our gifts from God. We are willing to be the sheep. But it's difficult to remind ourselves that sometimes the good shepherd is removed and someone comes in to be the leader. That we are the ones to be the shepherd. We, like the disciples in today's story, are now called to give and lead. And so we must ask ourselves, what do we have to give our sheep? What do we have to give the people who follow us as Christians? More importantly, are, what are we able to give? Are we able, now not only can we give it, but then we're stepping up that challenge. We're not only giving but we're asking ourselves to give generously, even our most prized possessions. So what, on this World Communion Sunday, what are we able to give? What sacred gifts of God can we give to our world both today and tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and then we come back? What can we give generously? What has God put in our possession that we now must generously share with our world, our communities, God's creation, so that we are truly in communion 